point of that diagram, what we've got here is this comes originally from the Springfield. You start with your intervention, then you hope you get system change, and then you hope that that provides growth and then poverty reduction. So one way of triangulating is you start from your intervention and you try to follow it out. You, you see what the intervention's been doing. You talk to people in the market system, a range of different actors, and you get a perspective on what's changing. But you also want to take a different point of view, which is starting at the market system as a whole now in some market systems say financial services that's lots of good information already you know you can look at all the country level data and see you know how many bank accounts people have so you could also start with these statistics for example and then work backwards and see okay we know from our statistics that change has happened now what can we attribute or what can we where can we see an influence of the program so that would be to work back in and then the third step would perhaps be to, to, to combine the two to look at mm. the outward in and the inward out so inward out and outward in which is how we describe those two approaches and bring them together mm. and so that would be triangulation is trying to look at you know different points of view in order to have a greater sense mm. of certainty mm. so um, that's what that diagram is um, and uh, yeah, I mean, um, this was actually came from Hans Posthumus and uh, Fitcher One It Fun, isn't it? That they're, um, we, we, we put it as an example. It's not our diagram, we just put the nice colours in. But they did a really nice paper on when you can use different kinds of methods, which was actually very, it's a very good, clear diagram. And it's like kind of, what's the condition, is yes or no? And then it leads to a description mm. of different methods so that it's quite a, a good check you know um, on what you can do later at the beginning of a program cycle even though you change throughout uh, implementation throughout the five year three year programming you should have agreement between the funder and the implementer about what is it you're trying to um, to measure at the end of the day uh, often we see that that is something that is rethought at the end of the program and then it's kind of not fair. Um, the, the next one is that results frameworks should uh, contain a basket of indicators to measure progress with market systems development and financial inclusion. So historically, uh, funders are focusing on counting numbers of accounts and that's their key success metric. It's all about access, uh, which is quite a hindrance to, to, to build market systems. So what we are trying to say, and we're coming up with suggestions for how to do that uh, in this handbook, is to say that they should be equal uh, focus on indicators that are measuring at the market level. Um, that is not to say that access indicators and usage indicators are not valid, but they should be combined. Um, so monitoring, and this links back to how you use the results framework, but monitoring should break out of the log frame and become a vehicle for learning and adaptation. So I've so heard that a lot. And there is some guidance about how do you think about setting up, we call it enhanced monitoring. How do you track and how do you keep your eyes open for capturing any change that might be linked to your interventions? So we have some tools in the handbook that seeks to provide help to the funders on how to do this. And primarily, actually, the, the program implementers. We have a chapter on evaluation, and here we are saying that um, evaluations should identify and access all substantial contributions to outcome, not just those of the intervention. So basically, going back to the market systems, that it's not about individ individual initiatives, but it's about assessing through the overall program theory of change what has been the combined changes due to lots of in, uh, interventions. Uh, next one, uh, uh, the impact evaluation in, in the field of uh, financial inclusion, again, has been a lot on poverty reduction, well-being at the client level, where we are then saying it needs to be at the market systems. When in fact, we are saying that not all programs need to measure at the, at the individual uh, poverty level, but that's to the industry to decide whether we feel comfortable as an industry that we are, in fact, that the industry is beneficial for um, for people. So what are the what are the challenges you have with this? I mean, it's a very huge fund. Yeah. So what kind of challenges are we facing? I mean, the size is the biggest challenge because yeah. it's multi-donor. So. The way we give out funding is in it's what called like window competitions. So there'll be they're either like country windows. So we give out 
we've run three in Zimbabwe, four in Tanzania, that kind of thing. Or there'll be um, windows which are focused on like things like we've had we've had a post-conflict window, so that can be in different countries, but it's yeah, for exactly federal states. So it's kind of political because like the donors, what the kind of projects they want to fund um, is, is often like that often really drives the um, what the different windows are and. Sometimes you feel a bit like you know you're you're getting all these results, and this is kind of clearly showing what works, what doesn't. But then trying to get that into the next round to influence the next round of funding is quite frustrating because you know the donors have their hot topic at the time and they have to fund them. So yeah, so that's been tough. The next round will be the presenters. Thank you so much. It was nice to meet you. The presenters will stay where they are. Um, impact evaluation approach that will help them address some of the challenges. They are very common to m more complex development programs, especially those who take a market systems approach, which is about causal inference in the absence of credible control groups or where the identification of control groups are it's just too expensive or where the focus is more on systemic analysis rather than on um, how sort of level uh, attributable changes with the black book so not telling you anything about how the system works so we that was one of the things how to evaluate open systems uh, medium and like uh, you have a national program like in Ghana supply chain systems development at a national scale for developing four commodity chains that, that connect to bigger markets so how do you do this if you have a medium to large and some population of this kind of systems and then how to trigger learning about contributions which is for systemic from a systemic change point of view it's really important. Two pilots, Vietnam 2013, Ghana 2015. That was a more market systems for the poor pro project, but it was the, the impact evaluation was done in one uh, province. The program was implemented in two provinces. This was national. Yeah. Uh, program budgets, loans, IFAT loans, but uh, in one it was one third of the total program budget, uh, 18 million in Vietnam. And then in Ghana, no, uh, half, half, and then in Ghana, one third. It was 17 million loan. Yeah. Am I going too fast? No. Okay. No. All right. What is Piala? Piala is consists of five key elements yeah, that you need to think of in the three main phases of evaluation, design, and conduct. Um, and it's basically phase one for the focusing and framing of the evaluation, a systemic theory of change approach. Um, and the way you do that is quite important. And here I have a little bit about the process and the design decisions that you need to make. Thinking of within the Piala framework, what are the considerations? So this is, uh, it's, it's about reconstructing and visualizing the program's theory of change with key stakeholders identifying the causal claims and mechanisms on which to focus, articulate the assumptions and the questions, and create a shared understanding and ownership of the theory of change. No, one thing I'm wondering is why would you reconstruct the theory of change? It's a very important question because um, Obviously, you do a desk review, and there is a lock frame. This is a very, it looks like a very lock frame type of, very linear, but, but it was a lock frame. That was the so program framework. Oh, okay. But things have changed in the meantime after five years. Yeah? And there are also external influences that have influenced the whole concept of the program. So it's, for us, it was very important to make a distinction. A distinction. We would evaluate, since we didn't have a credible baseline. What um, tools are you using? Yeah, so uh, we use a program called Tableau, um, um, but there, another useful one that I've used before in a previous job is ClickView, which is also quite good. But we find Tableau really uh, like intuitive, easy to use. It's quite you can train people really quickly to use it because um, it's I mean it's easier to make charts and graphs than Excel, and it sits really uh, well on just an Excel database or you can use other sorts of databases. But in development context, you don't really have, say, databases with millions of pieces of data, so it's generally Excel. Open source or is it also commercial? It's also commercial, yeah. But actually, you can get, a, there's a Tableau public free version which you can use. Um, it just does, so you can, and you can still share your dashboards online. Um, 
but you can't say um, use it in your report or uh, pub publish on your website. It has to be published on the Tableau website. But actually, a license for Tableau is about thousand dollars, so it's not crazy, crazy expensive if you just have one or two users. Yeah. When did you start doing this? So which the. <laughs> When did you make the decision to start reporting and sharing the results? Ah, okay, so I understand. Um, so last year was the first time we made our results open to the public. Uh, before then, it had just been to donors and other key stakeholders. What has been the feedback so far? It's been quite positive, which is kind of why we wanted to share this, um, and just to try and encourage other challenge funds and even other PST programs to share their results. Do you have any particular example of someone who previously did not receive any of this coming back to you to say, wow, yeah. you know about this? Yeah, yeah, we've had quite a lot, actually. And also because it was, um, it was profiled on the practitioner hub for inclusive business so we've had a series of webinars and that kind of thing on the back of the impact report so we've had quite a lot of feedback and just sort of tracking the hit rate on the website that kind of thing it's been a it's been a lot higher than it was before yeah, yeah. So it's great. And pr process tracing um, if you can see that okay so it was a health project that we know that the in, that the, the health for maybe it was you know child health improved and our program Worked with uh, you know um, lab technicians on and so that they could start to test for a particular uh, illness that affects children and we we know when we go to the hospitals that they started to use the service of these lab technicians and then we know that these hospitals are based in the cities where uh, you know th these indicators have fallen then you're starting to for example yeah, you're starting to build up an argument where it becomes plausible to say, okay, well, we know that many factors are involved, but because we can trace that route, you know, and if you go to the hospital and say, oh, yeah, we know that those uh, labs are working now, but we never use their services, then you, and then you would say, well, there's a change happened, but it probably isn't to do with our, our program, yeah. So it's, it's a kind of, um, in that case, it's a, uh, a question of looking at evidence from different perspectives, talking to people in the market, and making a case it's about a process of argument. It's not about a calculation. It's not a, a formula. It, you know, it's a bit judgment. If that, if that makes sense, yeah. You're working with a regulator. I just ask you. I mean, um, uh, does this respond to issues that you've seen before? I mean, does, does it kind of uh, you recognise these issues that I've. That, I've been saying it addresses, or, or is it a bit kind of like a theoretical and I'm out? Or? Well, this one, the first one, is easy. Right. It's a nice, it's a nice illustration. Yeah. Yeah. Really, um, oh, you have a good picture of it, so it's, it's a very good illustration. But it's it's not new. It's not new. No. Not new. Um, this one is adding value because uh, you have yes, no, yes, no, right. and it brings it toge together the triangulation. Well, okay. And the others you didn't present. I haven't. I haven't talked about. Okay. So the other ones are. Um, Okay, so this last one is actually a diagram from uh, two other authors. So Hans Posthumus and Fitcher won it fun, and it's um, they did some work, which is on it's published on the DCED website about choosing evaluation methods, and we included it in the guidance. So it's a very nice. Uh, what's the situation you were in? You know, is it yet? Yeah, is it this or that? Yes or no? And it leads you towards different uh, possible approaches. So it's a bit small to give, go into the detail, but. Um, it, it's someone else's work, but uh, in the context of the guidance as a whole, yeah, I think it would be could be quite helpful to uh, to people. I mean, the key thing is it's just about trying to create some level of consistency so that you can be able to compare things. Right now, the way it is is the information out in the markets, different approaches, different methodologies, different sort of considerations, and therefore it's just quite difficult for you to be able to compare the various data. But if you've got this, this you create a consistent platform where you can be able to pick and compare things. Now. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very useful. Good. Well, I hope it will become adopted that how you apply this guide, it doesn't tell you do this, do this, do this. It's more like the, the, the principles. And I think it does take some time to read this and digest it. I mean, the document is only 40 or 50 pages, but it might take, a, you know, a couple of readings. But I hope that, well, maybe not. Maybe, maybe you'll just, you know, 
you could you know it would be easy but for me it took a while to to sort of think this through and and, and now it's in my head and it's helped me I mean I tend as a evaluation company and we bid for other projects successfully using this framework and so I think for me I, I found it useful uh, to do that so I hope it will be useful for, for others as well. Does anybody know MDF market development facility or anything about it before, before I start and get down and dirty with systemic change? No? Nobody has any? Okay. Well MDF is a Australian government funded um, uh, market systems uh, program. Uh, we, uh, it's, it's running in five countries. It's been operating in Fiji for about five years, in, in uh, Pakistan and, and Timor-Leste for around three years, and uh, at just recently, late last year, started in, in uh, Sri Lanka and uh, Papua New Guinea. So it's, a, it's across quite a wide region and, and, uh, <coughs> and diverse uh, contexts. Um, it is a diverse project, and, uh, and while we apply the same approach in, in each country, it's, it's moulded to the, to the country context, and, and, um, and we're working in, in a broad range of sectors. Um, horticulture, agriculture, agribusiness is a common sector thread across all five countries, but also working in tourism in, in a number of them, and, uh, and, and manufacturing, uh, ICT, and, um, and dairy and livestock in, 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 uh, in some as well. Um, interventions range from working with Fiji's first chocolate manufacturer uh, to um, local production of shoe components in Pakistan to uh, agricultural inputs, strengthening agricultural inputs markets in Timor-Leste, um, uh, reviving freshwater prawn industry in um, giant freshwater prawns in, in Sri Lanka to, uh, to connecting lucrative and a bit cut off and uh, uh, remote um, farmers and fisheries in, in Papua New Guinea to, to, to export markets, just to name a, a couple. Um, so we're going to delve straight into how we're dealing with uh, systemic change, trying to. Um, we have a, a well-established results measurement system. Um, it's a DCD, uh, DCD audited system, which I think that we have a, quite a good score, I believe, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. something yeah. in the 90s. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, we, we've we've established a framework for, for dealing with um, uh, systemic change across our interventions. So we're striving to define, uh, manage, and monitor progress um, towards systemic change, and I guess also to communicate the sum of all our 72 uh, interventions or partnerships we have across the five countries in you know 18 sectors or, or areas we're working. Um, you know, adds up to more than just the, the, the income and, and additional income of jobs. Um, we're we're <laughs> trying to trying to uh, we're striving to achieve change beyond just scale. We also want to you know look at. Uh, at the quality of the change that's happening. 10,000 people were likely to have 5,000 people adopt and over what period of time? And really what Chevron wanted to know was when is systemic change going to happen? How much longer do I have to keep giving you money? <laughs> I think that's what really what all donors are really looking, looking for. And so it's not a predictive analysis, but what it is is it's a management tool. And so what we did was we looked at analogous systems like hybrid corn seed, baling hay, an electric knife, like what really, how long did it generally take within a certain population? And then we also ran the past data. They don't have a lot of past data because these interventions are all five years or younger. So with fish farming, you can only measure every six months, the, the catfish yield every six months. With cassava, it's every six months to one year. So there's not a lot of past data to go on, but we did look at analogous systems. In other countries or? Um, the data comes from world, is worldwide. And it's all in a database. So basically what you do is you plug in your past data it calculates your coefficient of imitation and your coefficient of innovation. So that advertising effect and that, and it basically then gives you a, a curve for your innovation. And then what it does, it also plots other innovations. And you can look at how is our curve similar or different to, sim, you know, and, and like how similar is catfish farming practices to spreading hybrid corn seed amongst farmers? You know, in some cases it's very similar. In some cases, it might not be that similar at, at all. So we actually looked at like eight or 10 different analogous systems for each one that we measured. And then it's, it's kind of a gut check, you know? It's not um, it's it, it's not an exact science. It's just to try to give it some sort of indicator of like how long. And to be honest, 
the big story behind it is that really the takeoff point, the tipping point, which this isn't, it's not plotted appropriately here on the graph. Your takeoff is usually like here, right? You're talking eight to 10 years in on average. You know, and that, so when all these funders are, you know, pressuring you for results in five years, you're not going to systemically change a region or a population of people in five years. You're talking eight to 10 years before takeoff and 20, maybe sometimes even 30. And, you, and the thing is also, as we talked about market systems being dynamic, it might never take off. There are in, I mean, the U.S. has never adopted the metric system. That's an innovation for the U.S., but we like to measure things in feet and yards, despite the fact that the rest of the world has adopted. Why is that? You know, there's certain dynamics. The other thing that we needed to do was give um, Chevron and NDPI and PIN more of a picture of where are these innovations, their interrelatedness, right? So, for example, um, we... Well, I'll get to that in a second. We basically developed a maturity model, right? So we developed criteria, and this is kind of showing the five criteria going going vertically is amongst all of their partners, have they been able to develop a coordinated strategy and implementation plan that they're all agreeing to sort of take similar approaches for their implementation in the region? How strong are the networks? Have they been able to develop a really like healthy network of folks? Um, how well is the human cap? So the human capital alignment is really kind of this process embedded within within this maturity model. How well are resources being aligned? So it's like, okay, great. DFID and USAID have both agreed that this is a really important intervention, but if they're not also putting money towards it and they're not agreeing, uh, it's probably not going to go much of anywhere, right? And then how well is the monitoring and evaluation aligned um, and meeting those objectives? So we basically have criteria for each one of these stages. We looked at the quant data, we looked at the qual data, we looked at the rates of adoption for each one of the 49 impact statements, and then we basically scored. So if it got a 1.5, in coordinated strategy and implementation plan, it was scored there, and maybe it was a, but they have yet a really strong network, so it scored a three in terms of stickiness, so on and so forth, and then we averaged those scores.